I am the leader of the Unchained Talons. I felt like I just shut my eyes when a filly's scream woke me up. My eyes snapped open as the ear-splitting scream filled the small room, making me jump and fall out of bed. I reached for Dreamwalker, which was sitting by the nightstand, as I looked for whoever was trying to attack us. What I saw was Bite trying to pull away from Wingnut, who had his hooves wrapped around her. Wingnut looked like he was still deep asleep. Let go of me! Bite yelled, still trying to pull away from Wingnut. I looked at the two of them for a full minute, then lowered Dreamwalker and started to laugh. Bite, you scared the shit out of me. She glared at me. Are you laughing? This isn't funny. Just calm down, I said, getting up and walking around the other side of the bed. Wingnut's a deep sleeper. It won't do you any good to scream and pull like that. Then what am I supposed to do? Just lie here and wait for him to wake up? She asked, still trying to pull away. I put a hoof on her shoulder. Relax for a moment. I'll show you. She did lying back down as I moved my hoo forward to Wingnut, letting it rest on his foreleg that was holding tightly onto Bite. He gets nightmares now and again. It's hard to tell because he doesn't cry in his sleep or anything like that. And this is how you can tell he's having one. Now that you're relaxed, can you feel it? He's... shaking? Bite said, looking at the colt. Why is he doing that? I started to slowly rub Wingnut's leg. He's been through a lot in his young life. He listened to his parents as they died. He was almost killed by Cazadors a couple months back. Nearly died to moss lurker poison. Had to watch as Stardust went crazy. Had to, to deal with almost losing Aura, Stardust, and me. And he's had to put a fee on a brave face through it all. I'm surprised he's been able to hold up as well as he has when he's awake. But I've noticed over the past few days he hasn't been sleeping well. She looked at him again with a sad expression on her face. I thought I went through a lot when losing my mom. You've been through your own shit over the years, I'm sure, Bite. I'm not trying to say Wingnut's life is harder than yours or anything like that. I think that when he's stressed out, he relieves some of his bad memories. That's why he's holding on so tight. Because he doesn't want to lose a hold of who he cares about. I said, moving my head down and whispering into Wingnut's ears. Shh. You're okay, kiddo. I'm here. As I spoke, his body relaxed with his hold-on bite. He slowly pulled herself free and slipped off the bed. When she did, Wingnut rolled over and looked like he was more relaxed. Bite still looked over and said, You're really good at that. I shrugged. I used to have nightmares when I was younger, especially after my mom disappeared. Vervain used to do the same thing to me to help me calm down. Why don't you just wake him up if he's having a nightmare? Rain told me that's not good to wake up some pony when they're having a nightmare. She said that could be worse in the long run because the nightmare will keep coming back until you face it. That sounds kind of wrong. It might, but I think she was right. I could help me face the wasteland. It was scary to leave my home, but I think it would have been worse if I hadn't faced my fears when I was younger. I said turned to grab my saddlebags, barding, and duster. What kind of bad dreams did you have? She asked as she put a set of Philly-sized leather armor on. I stopped in the middle of slipping on my duster. A quick flashback of memories from a few years ago, back before I entered Stable 28, came rushing to my head. A huge pony made of metal facing off against a manticore. A creature made out of lightning attacking Mom and then me. Dreams where I saw my chest ripped open, exposing a dead-looking heart that was slowly dying. Mom standing in the rain, covered in blood, with three dead pegasi lying next to her. The last one was a dream I had almost as much as one of my first memories of waking up in the stable. In that dream, she looked over at me, her mane stained red from the blood of the pegasi, saying, I'm sorry, my little star, but they had to die. They had to. I jumped a little as Bite poked my side. Did you hear what I said, Shadow? I shook my head and finished putting out my duster. Yeah, sorry. I was just thinking back to those days. My nightmares weren't normal. I think they were memories from before I went into Stable 28. 
Only I didn't know it at the time. You must have had it rough before you went into Stable 28. I'm guessing any pony who lives out here as long as it has it had it rough. Bite said. You don't know the half of it. I said as I finished getting ready. Hey, have you seen Aura? I saw her heading out just before you woke up. She made a little noise when she left, and that's what woke me up. I wonder why she didn't wake me up. I said, looking down at my pit buck, seeing it was a little past 7 a.m. Oh, that's why. She knows they don't normally do well this early. But yawned and stretched. I love getting up early. More time in the day to get shit done. I'm gonna go back to Tonto's cave and see if I can see more stuff that he has in there. You wanna come? Maybe. I wanna see what's going on first and check on Aura. I should also check on Wind Thrasher. She wasn't doing too well last night. Okay. Well, if Wingnut wakes up, tell him I'll be at Tonto's. She said as she headed towards the exit. You're in a good mood today. Are you sick or something? Where's the normally snide and bitchy bite? I asked. She turned back to look at me and just shrugged. I'm nice sometimes, you know. Just most of the time I'm surrounded by idiots, and I can't stand idiots. Then she left with a leisurely stroll. Rolling my eyes, I took one more look at Wingnut, who was still sleeping, then sighed and left the room. Turning right into the main chamber of Aura's cave, then heading back towards where Windthrasher was sleeping. She was lying there with her wings over her face, looking like she was asleep. Doing my best to keep my voice down, I said, Windthrasher, are you still asleep? She moaned and slowly covered her ears with her hooves. Not so loud. Talking even quieter. Sorry, I thought I was being quiet. Are you okay? She moaned again. Yeah, everything's so loud right now. My hand feels like some pony sitting in the back of my eyes with a wrench. My body won't stop shaking. And I feel like I have to throw up, but I can't. Don't even get me started on the light. It still burns. I walked over to her and started to rubber mane a little. I guess you don't do so well with alcohol. Apart from the wild pegasus you gave me in Winnapolis, that was the first time I'd ever drank more than a sip. I remember Ravane saying something about this morning about my body not being able to metabolize the liquor because of the genetic manipulation that was done to my body. Which means that alcohol affects me ten times more than it does neural ponies. I'm never drinking again, she said as her face still covered her wings. That might be a good idea. When every pony says that when they have a hangover, some ponies pray to the goddesses when they have a hangover or did something stupid while drinking. Like, don't let it be true and I'll never drink with a prostitute again. Or my personal favorite, please don't let her be pregnant and I'll never drink again. Well, if you want, I'll let you rest up some more. But if you're feeling better later, come find me. Also, if Wingnut wakes up, Tell him to head over to Tonto's. She waved a hoof, laughing lightly at the last thing I said. Thanks, Shadow. I'll try. I stroked her mane one more time, then got up and headed out of the cave. As soon as I did, I ran right into Fletch. I yelped, then backed up. Oh, sorry about that, Fletch. She was rubbing her chest where my horn had just poked her. That's fine. Just watch where you're going next time. And keep an eye on that thing. You'll poke someone's eye out. I'll try. So why are you up here? If you're looking for Aura, she's left already. She waved a talon. No, I already saw her. She's in the den talking with Dad. I was looking for you. I frowned. Why were you looking for me? We didn't get off on the right talon. Or hoof in your case. I've been kind of a bitch to you since we first met, and I was taking some of my anger at my little sister out on you and your friends. I wanted to say I'm sorry for what I did before, and wanted to get to know you better. Fletch said, looking away as if she was embarrassed. Damn, one fight with your sister, and now you've gone from bitch to kind. I'll admit I never saw that one coming. First, she made a fist with the same talon she'd been waving back and forth. Don't make me hit you. I laughed. I'm only teasing. 
I'd like to know you more better, too. Same for the rest of Aura's family. There's still so much I don't know. Well, I'm free now, if you don't mind me walking with you. I was gonna go see Aura, but I could use a walk. I also need to talk to Tonto later. Clutch smiled a little. Well, Aura's gonna be busy for a couple of hours. She's helping with a few things before Tonto talks about the Red Talon started, and that'll be later tonight. She's also helping Dad get set up for our remembrance of Greta. Well, if she's busy, I don't want to get in her way, so I guess we'll go for a walk, I said, heading down the path that led to the main level. And there was still a load of griffins all over the Crimson Canyon, some laying around, sleeping off inebriation from drinking from the opening celebration, others talking to other talon groups, and young griffins wrestling near the arena. Fletch noticed me looking at all the griffins around. I'm sure you've never seen this many griffins in one place, huh? I nodded. You don't see this many in New Pegasus. Where do they all come from? A good amount of them are red talons. Most of the time, over half of our working griffins here on jobs are away from home. They all put in their contracts on hold for the celebration. That's something that's stipulated in every Talon contract. The rest of them come from all over Equestria, from Manhattan, Hoovington, and Van Hoover. Our grandmother made quite the name for herself when she started the Talons, and since we're the biggest Talon group in the Wasteland and have the biggest territory, a lot of Talon groups come here for the celebration, too. When you have freelancers, either ones that used to be Red Talons that want back in, or young griffins who want to join after they were either kicked out of their own Talon group or left. Fletch said as we walked past a pony from Cartwheel who was talking with two young-looking griffins. One was male, the other was female. They looked like twins. I noticed that the male griffin had two odd-looking swords. What kind of weapons are those? I've never seen them before. She looked back at them and chuckled. They look like claws from a hellhound. Not every griffin in the wasteland can afford to get as nice a weapon as we have, so they make their own. And those two must be tough if he was able to take down a hellhound and make swords from his claws. I'll say, though I've never really met a real hellhound apart from Rar, but he's a different breed of hellhound. I said as we started to walk around the area. Rar, huh? I've heard that name before. Fletch said, scratching the bottom of her beak. Oh, right. He was that hellhound that was in the bramble where my shit-faced aunt was. Yeah, I helped him escape the place, and in turn, he didn't kill me, and he helped me take the place down for good. How'd you hear about that? She waved a talent in the air again. Mom keeps an eye on things going on around here. She's always doing her best to keep an eye on griffins like Gina. Before the Queen sent you to look into the Bramble, she tried contacting us. I was the one who was offered the contract. But at the time, I was working on something else with these two idiots I usually work with, and I couldn't do it. I think the Queen was waiting till Apollo went to freedom again to talk to him. But you showed up first. Still, I was in the area before you went there and decided to ask her out about the place before I headed back home. I couldn't get anything from any pony. The only info I got was that I had to talk to a griffin named Gina. So when I got back, I made sure to tell Mom about it. I bet she was pissed. Not really. She knew Gina was operating near New Pegasus again, just not where. She didn't get mad until reports came in about you and your friends going into the Bramble. Fletch replied. We walked for a few more minutes before I decided to change the subject. So, Giggy said something about there being 300 griffins in the Red Talons? How'd you get so big? Flush laughed. We weren't always so big. Around, oh, I don't know, 80 to 100 years ago, we only had around 40 griffins. Then, Gail Windrider and her griffins from Stable 14 showed up and joined us. She had over 100 griffins at the time who left the stable with her, and didn't leave or die when they got out. When they joined, our territory grew like wildfire. She was very accomplished as a contractor, or so my father says. She was his grandmother. That caught me by surprise. So, Apollo's grandmother and the griffin he used to love were both named Gale. 
It's not as uncommon of a name with griffins as you think, but yes. My Aunt Gail was named after Gail Windrider. Our grandmother, my mom's mom, was good friends with Penelope, who was Gail's daughter, and she named her youngest daughter after Gail because she looked up to her. At least that's what Mom told me, Fletch said, moving out of the way of two young griffins who went running by us. What was she like? Your other aunt, I mean. Aura doesn't talk too much about her, I asked. Aura didn't know her that well. She spent most of her time with Dad or Gina. They both took a lot of her time with training. Fletch said, rolling her eyes. Sorry. Even though I'm trying to get over that, it's still hard. Anyway, I spent a lot of time around Aunt Gale. To most griffins, they only saw a kind griffin who was a good fighter in the arena. But out of it wouldn't hurt a bloat sprite. In reality, Gale was the kind of griffin who manipulated others without even letting them know. When I was younger, I didn't notice it. But as I got older and started to learn from her, I saw that most of Mom and Gina's fights were because of her. Gale had a way of getting under your feathers and nipping at you without you even knowing it. She kept nipping and biting until you couldn't take it anymore, and you'd lash out at the griffin she wanted you to be angry with. Is that why Gina killed her? I asked. The manipulation? Fletch sighed and looked around. Seeing no griffin or pony, she said, The record says that Gina wanted Mom's job to be the leader. She wanted to take both of her sisters out to make sure that no one could contest her role as leader. She went after Gale first and started an uprising with other griffins. But she got caught. From the look on your face, you don't believe it, I said with a smile. I don't. The day that Gina killed Gale, I was supposed to be training with Gale in her cave. When I went to meet up with her, she sent me away, saying she had something to take care of. She told me that she had a mission for me, sent me to an LR camp that had a, was a few hours away from the house. Said she'd pay me half of what she got for the contract if I did it for her. So I went. Turned out that the NLR camp had no idea a red talent was coming, and they sent me away. When I got back, Gail was dead. Gina was arguing with Mom, and a fight almost broke out. Then Mom banished her from the talons, along with five other griffins who were said to be helping Gina with her coup. I thought about it for a moment, then asked, How would killing both sisters make her the leader? Aura said Gina never fought with Gigi for leadership. In our laws, if a leader of the Red Talon dies before the rebirth celebration, one of her siblings would take over until the celebration started. And this happened six months before that year's celebration. Sure, Gina would have had time to set up her rule before that day. And with Mom and Gale dead, no griffin around here would have challenged her for control. By that time, Gina was known to be the best fighter ever seen in the Red Talons since Greta herself. So why don't you believe it? I asked. Because those five griffins who were sent away with Gina were Gale's friends. I knew them, and they hated Gina. Also, she killed them all not long after she was banished. So you think Gina was framed? I asked. I'm honestly not sure. It's possible that Gina did offer them something to gain their help. But it's also possible that Gale was behind something and Gina found out and killed her for it. I've tried asking Mom about it, but she always sends me away when I bring it up. Tonto might know something too, but he also refuses to talk to me or any of us about it these days. All I know is that something happened that they don't want us to know about, Fletch replied. We just reached the top of one of the far cliffs, and we're now outside of a large cave opening with a sign over it that read, Storyteller. If Gina was framed for the death of her sister, I can see why she'd be so mad about her banishment and why she keeps saying she was betrayed, I said. So, is this Tonto's place? She nodded. Yeah, it is. And when it comes to my aunts, I don't think I'll ever know the full story. Really, no matter what she did back then, she's gone mad now. I can agree with that. I was going to ask Gigi about this before, but she's been busy. Did anyone catch her after the attack on Cartwheel? No. Three griffins died in the attempt, though. From the reports of the one griffin who made it back, 
said that it took them over a day to catch up to her. When they did, they found her injured in a cave near the ruins of Gravel City. She was in no shape to fight, and they could have brought her in. But a male griffin and a full set of power armor took them by surprise. He killed two of the griffins before they knew what was happening. The last two tried to run when he showed up, but only one got away. I wonder if he's the leader that Gina was talking about before. As far as we know, he is, Fletch said, sitting down next to me and looking up at the cloudy sky. We don't know much about him. He doesn't seem to show himself much, leaving Gina to command others. The only things we've been able to learn about him from a couple of Unchained we've captured is that he used to be a Red Talon. He's very close to Gina. He goes by the code name of Archer. So, he's the real brains behind this new Talon group, huh? I asked. As far as we can tell. Honestly, it was my mother who worried. She doesn't really know what'll happen if Archer keeps getting more griffins to join him. From what I can tell, he wants to destroy the Red Talons. But there's no way he can get that many more griffins than the Red Talons. Maybe not. But over half of our griffins are either too young to fight, if something happens, or they're too old. We have a lot of griffins, but not as many fighters as we'd like. If the Unchained Talons gets enough griffins to join them and they attack, we wouldn't stand a chance. Fletch settled a sigh. I nudged her with a hoof. Don't look so glum. I'm sure Gigi will think of something to take care of them. Remember, you all have contracts with a shitload of ponies in the wasteland. I'm sure most of them would come to your aid if something happened. Tonto's voice echoed out around the entrance of the cave. That's right, Shadow. Fletch would do well to remember that. We both looked over to see the older griffin standing there with Bite next to him. Fletch smiled. You're going senile, you old cute. Those ponies pay us for work, not the other way around. Tonto just laughed. I may be old, but I'm not senile yet. What I mean is that one reason we make sure to have such good relationships with so many ponies so is that we can count on them if we ever need to when we're in trouble. The NLR alone would come to our aid if we needed it, because they like the way we do business. If a Talon group like the Unchained took over, the NLR wouldn't like that one bit. I guess you're right. Still, it worries me, Fletch said, getting back to her talons. Anyway, Tato, are you busy now? Shadow wanted to talk to you. I was just talking to Young Bite about some of the old tech I found when I was still a young griffin, working with box tape. You too can come in if you'd like he said. Bite beamed happily. Shadow, you have to see the stuff he has in here. I've never seen so many books and old tech in my life. Looking over at Fletch, I asked. Come in with me, and we can talk more. I still haven't told you about my time in the Wasteland. She shrugged. I guess I can do that. I'm not needed for anything until tomorrow anyway. We both followed Tonto and Bite into the cave. The cave had to be the biggest cave in Crimson Canyon. My eyes went wide as we walked in, not only because the ceiling was at least two stories tall and almost as big around as the atrium of Stable 28, but there were also rooms to each side. One I could see was filled with rows and rows of books and scrolls. Memory orbs of many colors were set into shelves all over the main chamber, along with more books. A recollector was sitting in the middle of all of them, the other room looked like it was Tonto's bedroom. Even in there, I could see more books laying all over the place. On more shelves high into the main chamber, I could see older model pit bucks, sprite bots, broken weapons, old rusted spears and swords, a helmet from Enclave power armor, a few broken old terminals, and a Ministry Mayor statuette. Rainbow Dash from the look of it. Out of all the stuff in the cave, the statuette was the first thing I ran over to. Is this really what I think it is? Tonto smiled gently. Yes, I believe Box Tape told me you already found three of them. When did he tell you that? I asked. I visited him a day or so after you left for the Twin Cities. I've never been interested in collecting them myself. That one has been here all my life. The story my teacher told me was that Absent Moon left it wherever he ran off to. I've been waiting for you to come visit me so I could give her to you. 
My eyes got wide. Really? Why would you do that? Because I think you might be able to find them all. Also because I know you are descended from one of the Children of the Night. Rainbow Dash herself was the pony who ran that group along with Luna. She's yours if you want her. Think of it as a gift for helping the Red Talons so much. He replied. Helping the Red Talons? I haven't done anything for you. You've always helped me. I said. Fletch laughed a little. Shadow. If it wasn't for you and your friends, we wouldn't know about the Unchained Talons yet. They could have gotten strong without us even knowing about it, until it was too late. You also saved my life and the life of my griffins by calling in my mother when they attacked us near Stable 28. Tonto added, You also brought home misery, and that alone was worth so much to this old griffin. So, take her. I didn't hesitate to examine her. First, looking down at the statuette of the Pegasus who ran the Ministry of Awesome, she was younger, looking so full of life and pride. On the base, it said, Be Awesome, sounding so much like Rainbow Dash I've heard the stories about. I let my magic wrap around it, and like the others, it felt like something inside me changed. I felt like I could move a little faster and with more grace, both with my magic and my body. I placed her in my saddlebags with a smile, right next to the other three. Now I had Rarity, Fluttershy, Twilight, and Rainbow Dash. Four of the six Ministry Mares. Image, Peace, Arcane Sciences, and Awesome. The only ones left to find was Applejack for Wartime Technologies and Pinkie Pie for Morale. Yeah, we could find the other two would complete the set. Who made those? Byte asked. I've never heard of them before. Tonto sat down on a large, overstuffed pillow in one corner. I believe it was Rarity who made them with the help of a couple unicorns she knew. She made a set of all six for all of her friends. All six Ministry Mares and Princess Luna. Not much is known about how Rarity made them, but no matter what you do to them, they just won't break. They've withstood the war in time itself and still look like they were just finished. I've heard rumors that they're something called soul jars, but I'm sure that's just silly. I looked over at Tonto again and asked, What's a soul jar? He frowned a little as he thought. Well, from what I've read in some nasty zebra books, a soul jar is an item that has a soul placed into it by a zebra witch doctor or even a unicorn. When a soul jar is made, that soul within it keeps that item from ever being destroyed. Would be a good bit of magic to... Make armor, I'd think. However, the soul itself that resides in the soul jar would turn evil with hatred and resentment for being pulled out of its body and imprisoned into them. And that sounds like a nasty bit of magic, I said. If it was possible, then I would agree with you. A soul should be able to move on to its next life when the body dies. If a soul is taken from its body and trapped, even and that body dies... The soul can never be reborn, or even move on from this life that it once had. A soul is eternal, not meant to be on Equus for more than a century or less. Being tied to this land for far too long can make a soul go dark, and a dark soul is never a good thing. At least, that's what many griffins believe. Bite rolled her eyes. I'm sure that's just a story. You can't just pull a soul out of a pony and put it into something... Just a bunch of zebra mojo they came up with to make a scare to them. Well, little one, I'm not sure if it's real or not, but I wouldn't say it's impossible, Tonto said, patting the top of Bite's head. I walked over to the memory orbs and asked, So what are all these memory orbs of? The old griffin walked over and looked up at the memory orbs. Oh, most of these are just random memories of ponies during the war I've collected over the years. He pointed to a row of them that were set apart from the rest. Those are the ones that matter. They're all memories of Greta. Most of them have been here since she started the Red Talons. Some were found over the years by my predecessors. How many have you found? I asked. Tonto looked over at Fletch. My dear, would you mind grabbing the last one on the left for me? No problem, Tonto. Fletch said, flying up to the highest shelf and grabbing the orb. Tonto took it from her and then showed it to me. 
This is the only one I've been able to find that belonged to Greta. I also believe that it was one of the most important ones. I look closer at it. What do you mean? The old griffin smiled. I know you've been looking into the Children of the Night. I'm sure you found some memory orbs of them during your travels. But have you found any that took place after the war? I shook my head. No, I've seen a couple of Night Stalkers. One that was during the attack on Shattertooth Ridge, another when he killed an equestrian captain who was working with the zebras, and a couple more. I also have one that was a zebra that ended up working with them. I also have one from Greta during the attack on Las Pegasus. His eyes seemed to dance when he heard that. You found a memory orb of Greta's on the day of the zebra attack on New Las Pegasus? Well, I didn't find it. My mom found it. She left it for me with lonely hearts. The old griffin looked like a fool in a candy store when he asked. Shadow, would you let me see it? I thought about it for a moment and sighed. It's a long memory, but if you want to view it, then I'd be fine with that. But I can't let you have it. Mom said she thinks she missed something in it, and she was hoping to be able to figure out what she missed. I won't take it from you. Though, I would love to add it to my collection. I mostly want to verify something, and if that orb is the one I think it is, then I think I may just be able to put together a puzzle I've been trying to figure out for some time now. Bite walked closer, looking at the orb. Tonto, how can you watch a memory orb? You're a griffin. He laughed lightly. Oh, little one, I have a recollector, don't you see? The one on the shelf is for a griffin. She looked up at the shelf. Oh, I was wondering if that's what that was. It's shaped very differently than the one Rusty has. Fletch came over to me while Bite was talking to Tonto. Shadow, I need to go and check on a few things. I'll let you hang out with Tonto for a while. If you're still up for talking more later, I'll be at the top of Crimson Canyon guarding the east entrance. I smiled. I'd love to talk more Fletch. Honestly, I'm a little surprised that you're so nice. Tonto looked at us and chuckled. She comes off as tough and mean, but deep down, Fletch is just a sad little girl who wants to be loved. She looked over at him. Bite me. Then she looked back at me and smiled. See you tonight? Yeah, I'll be there. When she was gone, I looked back at Tonto. She's not so bad. I'm just happy to see her smile again. It's been too long. Now, if she'd just find a griffin to forge a life bond with, then there would be a happier place for her. He said. Bite looked out of the crave's entrance, then back at Tonto. She's not bad looking for a griffin. I'm surprised she doesn't have more males drooling over her. Most males are too scared of her, to be honest. That, and she said that she wouldn't be with any griffin that couldn't prove that he's just as tough as she is. She'll be alone forever in that case, I said. Tonto laughed. I agree, and so does she. Fletch told one griffin that's been infatuated with her for years that if he could win 50 fights in the arena, she'd give him a chance. That's a lot of fights, but doable, Bite said. No... It's one thing to win a fight here and there. Griffins normally lose out, one out of every five fights. What Fletch wants is for a griffin to win fifty fights in a row, he said. Damn, I said, my eyes growing wide. Who was the griffin she's told to do that? Groger, Tonto said simply. My jaw dropped open. Groger? Wait, isn't he the taller one? Yes. He's the one she always refers to as Fuck when she's angry and forgets his name. I started to laugh. That bird brain? He'll be waiting forever. I take it you really haven't dealt with Fletch and any of the other two, Ash, have you? Groger has already won 49 fights. One more and he'll finally be able to prove himself to her. Tonto said with a laugh. Wow. I had no idea he was such a good fighter. I hope he's able to do it. Hmm. Indeed. Tonto said. 
showing me the memory orb again. I want you to watch this and tell me what you think afterwards. In the meantime, would you mind if I watched the one that you have? Yeah, I think I can do that. I said, bringing out my pet buck and searching my inventory until I found the memory orb Mom gave me. Pulling it out, I gave him the last orb in the box. Just make sure you get it back to me. What am I going to do when you two are looking into memory orbs? Bite asked. Tonto smiled kindly. Bite, go look into my room. You'll see a box on the other side of my bed. Bring it to me, please. She walked into the other room and returned a moment later with the box. Why do you need this? He took the box from her and opened it. Inside was another recollector. This one is made for ponies. It used to belong to Box Tape. He left it to me a few years ago. If you want, you can pick any of those orbs and watch them. Really? Bite said, running over to a shelf and looking through the various memory orbs. I took the one Tonto had and looked down at it. What's so important about this orb? He just gave me his kind smile. Just watch it, and you'll see. Knowing he wasn't going to tell me more, I laid down next to the orb, conjured my magic onto it. That familiar feeling of growing accustomed to at this point filled my body, and the world melted away. At least with this orb, I didn't have to guess who my host was. Greta was walking down a dark hallway, her talons slightly sinking into what looked like a polished wood floor, but could only be made out of cloud. Each step she took on the floor gave off a small puff of white. Her body felt tired. There was a twinge of pain in her left rear leg, and I could feel like she was missing a digit on her right talon. At the end of the hallway was a large door with four pegasi and black combat armor in front of it. Over the door was a sign that read, Head Counselor. When she drew closer to the door, one of the pegasi stepped in front of her. I'm sorry, Captain, but I can't let you inside. The Head Counselor is in a meeting with... Greta grabbed him, lifting him off the ground. I don't take orders from you, Grunt. Let me pass before I gut you like a fish. The other three started to charge up their laser rifles. Drop him, Greta. We have orders not to let anyone in. She glared at the others, then slowly pulled out one of her blades. It was misery. She pointed it at them and said slowly, Like I said, let me in before I gut all of you. I don't give two shits what Night Stalker told you. Step aside, soldier. The pony she was still holding her talons said, Put me down, you filthy griffin. I felt Greta's heart start to beat faster when she said that. What did you call me? She threw him into the floor. Filthy griffin, huh? Is that what you all think? Is that why you fucking pegasi destroyed my home? I'll eviscerate every last one of you if I have to. Fuck this, take her down, one of the other guards said, firing his battle saddle. Greta went nuts. She ducked under the shots, twisted her blade around, and cut the pony in half. You fucking morons made a big mistake. She jumped over the shot, twisted around, and stabbed misery through another's head. Then she reached onto her back and pulled out another sword. This one was shaped just like Misery, only it was pure white with the same silvery glow on the edge. That one must be Joy. She spun around and beheaded a third Pegasus that was starting to walk towards the Pegasus she threw. He looked up at her. I'm sorry? Greta stabbed him in the eye. I don't care how sorry you are. You should have let me pass. She said, pushing his body aside and opening the door. Inside, sitting at a wooden desk, was Night Stalker. He was starting to get some gray in his mane. He now had the goatee I'd seen him with when I first saw him on the surveillance video from the Lucky Horseshoe. Sitting on the other side of the desk was Thunder Lane. He turned when Greta walked in and smiled. What'd I tell you, boss? I knew she'd... Night Stalker interrupted him. 
You can leave now, Thunderlane. I believe Greta came for a talk. Thunderlane chuckled, getting to his hooves. Fine by me, boss. I should go turn in my report anyway. He started to walk past my host when his eyes fell on the dead bodies just outside the door. Shit. Looks like the birdie made a mess. Greta's eyes snapped to Thunderlane's. You better leave before you join them. Thunderlane just chuckled again and moved a little closer, whispering so only she could hear. Temper, temper, Greta. Just remember what I told you, something like this would happen one day. Just too bad you weren't at Griffinstone with us. You missed all the fun. Before the Black Pegasus could finish what he was saying, Greta grabbed him by the throat and slammed him into the wall. Then her other talent came up as she started to hit him, first in the face and then in the gut, followed by another to the face. Over and over again, she beat the Pegasus until he was bleeding, and one of his eyes was swollen shut. Shut the fuck up, Thunderlane, you piece of shit! You fucking enclave rat! I should have slit your throat years ago! Nightstalker's voice echoed in the room. Greta, drop him! For a moment longer, Greta glared into Thunderlane's face. He started to chuckle a little. Yes, good little dog. Do as your master says. She moved her face closer to his. One day, Thunderlane, you're going to die by my blades. I know you had some part in what happened to my home, and when I find out what part it was, you're dead. She punched him one more time, then threw him into the hallway. His body landed on one of the dead guards, then slid through the pool of blood, leaving behind a smear. He didn't get back up. When my host looked back at Night Stalker, he was still sitting behind his desk, watching her. Did that make you feel better? She drew misery and pointed it at him. I don't want another word out of your mouth, Absent. I know what you did, and what role you played in what happened in Griffinstone. He didn't even flinch, even when she moved to the desk and put the blade an inch from his left eye. You have no idea what you're talking about, Greta. I don't, do I? So it wasn't your special ops team along with you and some of the children who attacked our home? Was it some random group of rough pegasi, or was it Dashites, huh? What bullshit excuse do you have for me this time? I told you that the Griffins were making trouble for us in the skies. They kept taking down the cloud cover near Griffinstone, not listening to the new laws that have been put into place, sending wings of young Griffins to Pegasi cities to cause havoc, he said calmly. So you used a chemical bomb on them? she yelled. Do you know how many Griffins died? 532, 42 of which were children. Another fifty expecting mothers, two hundred and fifty-eight elder griffins, one hundred and eighty-two fit griffins who are guarding the skies and ground. Yes, I know. I saw the numbers. I saw the faces. I heard their screams as they died. Nightstalker answered. You led the team there. You told me before you left that you wanted to come to some kind of understanding, to sign a treaty with them. Instead, I find out that you let your grunts bring a chemical bomb with them, and when they refused to listen to reason, you had them all killed. And that was your home, the place where Gran raised us both, the land where we used to watch the Aurora Borealis during the winter. How could you do that to our home? Griffinstone hasn't been my home for a long time, Greta. It's the same with you. They kicked us both out when me... Me when Gran died. You when they didn't like the way that you decided to join the war. It was nothing more than a land of greedy, selfish griffins who refused to see reason. They needed culling. So you killed them? She yelled. I didn't kill anyone! Nightstalker exclaimed as he slammed his four hooves on the desk and stood, his temper finally raising. I had no idea that bomb was there. I still don't know who brought it, who set it up, who decided to let it go off. I never wanted them to die. I didn't like that land anymore, didn't see it as home anymore, 
but I would never just outright kill those griffins unless they gave me a reason to. Bullshit, Absent. I'm not going to listen to your lies anymore. I saw the reports. You gave the order. You made sure they were equipped for it. Every pony had rebreathers or power armor with them. Three ponies from the special ops even said they saw you threaten three of the council griffins. She said, misery shaking in her talons. Night Stalker backed away from her a little. You think you got it all figured out? If that's so, then why are you even here? Why haven't you tried to kill me? You didn't seem to have a problem killing my guards. They deserved it as much as you do. I know for a fact that three of them are in the Special Ops Corps. They were all at Griffinstone with you that day. They might be. But Cloud Slicer is just a normal guard with three wives, uh, three kids and a wife. He was, anyway. He's also one of Thunder Lane's spies. He got what he deserved. And as to why you're still alive, that's because I'm not stupid enough to try and take you head on. I just wanted you to see my face. See my anger before I destroyed everything you've spent the last five years trying to build. For the first time since Greta walked into the office, Night Stalker looked scared. What do you mean? Greta returned misery to the sheath on her back and took a few steps back. You betrayed me for the last time, Absent Moon. He looked confused by that. Betray you? I had never betrayed you, Greta. You're my best friend. The only one on Equus that I trust. That I respect. That I... He stopped talking before he said what was on his mind. I could feel the anger in Greta as she looked at her old friend. Never betrayed me? Absent. Do you know how much shit you've pulled over the years? How many of your friends you've let take the fall for you? Don't call me that. Absent Mood is dead. He was nothing more than a scared colt. She laughed. Bullshit. You're still that scared little brat I found half dead in the snow all those years ago. You've just been hiding behind this mask of Night Stalker. You're wrong. I've never been more right, Greta said, taking another step back. You just can't see what you are. You're a coward. You always let every pony or griffin else take your place when you're about to get hurt. Phoenix Heart died for you. Your parents died for you, and you let Petal die. Your stupidity for sending Comet Tail after your sister led her to her death, too. Babs lost her leg in the same fight. Amethyst Star was murdered by a pony who wanted to get back at you. Minette went off and killed herself a month later because of Amethyst's death. You let countless others die to help you build Falling Shadows, which you couldn't even get right, and because of that... Equestria died. Now you've shut out the world below the clouds, letting the rest of the ponies and griffin down there die when the Enclave have the resources to help. You traced Rainbow Dash off, you sent Scootaloo away, and made this Dashite program because of her sending more Pegasi to die in the wasteland that represents what's left of Equestria. And now, you've killed the only place that you could call home. The land you grew up in, all because you're too scared to let some pony else take control. To do what you think is fucking right. You make me sick. I said that I had no idea that bomb was there. Night Stalker yelled, kicking his desk aside. I've done a lot of bad shit in my life, Greta. But I would never have ever let something like that happen in Griffinstone. And how dare you blame me for the deaths of my friends and comrades. I did everything to protect them and Equestria. Petal wasn't my fault either. If you would have told me she was in the city, I would have made her leave. You talk about betrayal, Greta. And it's your fault she's dead. Her blood is on your talons. You're the one who betrayed me and her. I never betrayed you or any of my friends or family. Oh, that's rich. What do you call what happened the night before your fucking wedding, huh? Did you tell Lightning that? How you came up to my room, tears running down that face? 
crying over the death of your little sister again. When you couldn't sleep because of the nightmares you kept having, your breath still smelled like wild pegasus. Did you tell her how you kissed me? How you fucked me? Then left the next morning, leaving me alone and confused? She screamed. Nightstalker's eyes went dead. I was drunk. It was a mistake, I told you that. Greta moved closer to him again, then she whispered. Was it a mistake when you told me that you loved me? Was it a mistake when you told me how you truly felt? When you started to kiss my body? When you cried as we made love? Or were you just afraid that ponies would think you were a freak because you loved a griffin? I... You what? She asked, pushing him back a little. Tell me, Absent. You fucking what? Love me? Nightstalker didn't say a word. It was like her words scared him somehow. So Greta continued. You don't love anyone. Maybe you're right, and Absent Moon is dead. He died when you took on the name Nightstalker and become the leader of the Children of the Night. You know what the sad part is? I loved the pony you used to be. I never saw Absent Moon as scared or weak. And that cold saved me from the bullies when we were young, and almost lost his eye because of it. And that colt wasn't weak. He just thought he was. I never cared if you were a pony, because deep down I know that I had feelings for you ever since that day. The day you saved me and got that scar. That's why I followed you to Equestria when you came back. That's why I returned later when you joined the war effort. That's why I became a child of the night. That love I had for you is why I helped you start the Enclave alone with those other idiots. I've watched you commit monstrous atrocities over the years, and I've stayed by your side because of how I felt. I always made excuses for you, because I was blind to who you really were. A monster. Not this time. This time, you've gone too far, and I'm not going to let my feelings for you blind me from the truth. Greta turned for the door, as Night Stalker said quietly, I am not a monster. Greta stopped and looked back at him. Yes, you are. It's about time you see that. Goodbye, Night Stalker. If we ever meet again, I'll kill you. Same goes for any of your lackeys if you try to send them after me. Greta? Where are you going? Night Stalker asked as his voice sounded more under control. She started to walk away again, her talons stepping in the blood of the dead ponies. I'm going to do as I said before. I'm going to destroy everything you've built. I'm going to destroy everyone you care about. I'm going to make sure that when you finally take your last breath, you'll have nothing left. I may not be able to kill you right now, but when you have no pony left to protect you, no power left, you'll finally see that you're nothing. No wife, no kids, no underlings, no pride, no monster. A monster with nothing to destroy is the saddest of all beings. You're going to destroy Falling Shadows, Aren't you? He asked. She just laughed. No, I won't have to. I'm just going to make sure that you can never use it again. I'm going to make sure no pony can ever use it. I'll stop you, Greta. If you go down this path, I'll fucking destroy you! He yelled as Greta stepped past the unconscious Thunderlane. She stopped at that, then smiled, turning back one more time to look back at her old friend. No, you won't, Night Stalker, because I'm going to the surface to make something of my own. I'll find as many griffins as I can and train them to become the most powerful group of fighters you've ever seen. I'm going to keep the way of life of Griffinstone alive. We'll live for the contract, for money, and there's nothing... You can do about it. 
she lifted up one of her talons, her claws covered in blood of ponies she killed. Remember my name, Night Stalker. Greta Blood Talon is going to make sure you pay for what you did to our home. Got it memorized? She tapped her head with a claw, smirking. With that said, Greta opened her wings and flew down the hall, out past the far door, past ponies in combat armor and power armor, and flew high into the sky, turning west. As she flew, the alarm started to go off under her from what looked like a huge military base in the clouds. The tears started to fall. Her chest was tight, and she did her best to hold back sobs. She looked down at her still bloody talons. Greta Blood Talon. Eh, could have come up with a better name than Blood Talon. Oh well, I can't turn back now. I'm sorry, my old friend, but I can't let the monster you've turned into live on. And I just hope that Petal will forgive me for breaking my promise. I can't watch over you anymore. Slowly opening my eyes, I took a minute to think about what I just saw. Greta left the Enclave because Night Stalker destroyed Griffinstone, or so she thought. The look I saw on Night Stalker's face when she accused him of setting off the bomb. He was telling the truth when he said he didn't know about the bomb. He was a good liar, but I've lived Night Stalker's memories, seeing what he's like when he lies and when he's being honest. I understood now, though, why Greta made some of the rules she did when she formed the Red Talons. She was in love with Night Stalker. They were also intimate at one point. That was something I'd never heard about. No pony must have known about that one night they'd spent together. They loved each other, but something kept them apart. I didn't know what came over me, but the emotional pain Greta felt somehow made its way to myself, and I started to cry. Quickly, I regained my composure and looked around the cave. I saw that Tonto was watching me from a cushion not far off. He smiled. Interesting memory, wouldn't you say? I didn't expect the repercussion on that memory gave you. Memory orbs are quite the magical artifact. Sad, more like, I said. Then something came to me from the memory. She called him Absent Moon in the memory. I thought you didn't know his real name. I didn't until you said something. That memory orb was in box tape stuff that I was able to save from his broken home. I watched it while the rest of the Griffins were partying. I thought you should see it, he said. I had no idea they felt this way about each other, I said, looking back down at the memory orb. I've always had my suspicions, but no proof until now. There were rumors over the years that those two were having an affair, but no one believed them. What I find interesting is how Night Stalker reacted to the accusations about him being the one who destroyed Griffinstone. Our history says that he was the one who ordered the attack, but what I saw on that orb makes me think he wasn't the one, Tonto said. I think you're right. Wait a sec. Why aren't you watching the orb I gave you? I asked. I will in a moment. I wanted to wait for you to wake. I wanted to be awake in case you had any questions. I chuckled a little. I'm not sure if I understand everything I saw or not, but if I have any, I can ask you later. Very well then, Shadow. I'll watch the orb I have. You can stay here for a while if you want, or go wander around the canyon. Today is still the first day of the celebration, and is the best one to meet other griffins. Tomorrow we'll have fights and more, Things will get chaotic on day two. Same goes for the last day as well. So take this time to mingle if you can, he said, putting on his recollector. I'll do that. I'll let Bite enjoy her memory orbs for a while, too, I said, seeing Bite laying on another cushion with her recollector. I'll see you later tonight then, Shadow, he said placing the memory orb I gave him into the center of the recollector and drifting off into the memory as it activated. I didn't get far from Tonto's cave when I ran into Aura. About time I found you. Where have you been? I was visiting Tonto, watching one of his memory orbs. Bites in there with him right now. I said, giving her a hug and a kiss. So, what are you up to? 
She smiled. Just finished up some prep with Mom. I wanted to see if you wanted to come meet up with some griffins I grew up with, and meet some of the other Talon groups. Sometimes I wondered if Tonto has a gift of foresight. He suggested exactly that. I said as Aura started to walk back towards the huts, and the mass of griffins walking around the Crimson Canyon. So was that all you were doing? Helping your mom with stuff? She blushed a little. Well, no. I decided to make my own small talent group. Mom was helping me with some of the stuff I needed. To know and make me sign a contract so I can work within the Red Talon territory. Wait, you started a talent group? How's that going to work with what we have to do? Don't worry. Since I'm the only member of the new group, it won't get in the way. It's just easier to work out being able to keep working in this area if I want. And still being able to come home whenever I want. Freelancers aren't let into the Crimson Canyon often. But talent groups are. At least ones that work with the Red Talon, that is. Maybe once this stuff with your mom finishes, we can settle down. I'll start bringing on more griffins. She said, still smiling. I guess I can understand that. So, what's this new group of yours called? She blushed again and rubbed the back of her head. I decided to name the group after you. The Shadow Talons. I blushed, stumbling over my words. Aura, I'm flattered, but you didn't have to name your new talent group after me. It sounds stupid. She laughed. Too late, it's already done. Besides, I think it has a nice ring to it. Fine. But I still don't like it. She moved her head down and kissed me. You'll learn to love it. Come on, let's go have some fun. I couldn't help smiling. Now that is a great idea. Over the next few hours, Zora introduced me to griffins that it was impossible for me to remember the names of most of them. We found Stardust and Vervain later in the day and had a couple drinks with them as we listened to more griffins sing on the stage. We danced, laughed, and played games with some of the younger griffins. I also got to meet one of Aura's old friends in her cave when the sun was going down. Her name was Natalia, and she had a griffin egg that was about to hatch. Natalia was pleased when I told her I'd never seen a baby griffin, and she let Aura and I stay as the egg started to tap, then shake, and then, finally, crack open. I'll admit that the baby griffin, what they call a chick, was a little gross when it first hatched. But once Natalia had cleaned it off, it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. It was beautiful to watch how much love was in Natalia's eyes as she held onto her newborn son. What are you going to name him? I asked as it slowly stroked its soft feathers of the sleeping chick. I won't. I was hoping Aura would do me the honor. Since my life partner passed away, I have no one to do so. Natalia said. Why wouldn't you name your own son? I asked. Aura smiled. It's the father's job to name their sons, and the mother's to name their daughters for griffins. If one of the parents die before the egg hatches and a name wasn't picked out before, the chick is normally named by a close friend. She looked over at Natalia. Are you sure you want me to do this? I haven't been around for a long time, Talia. I know, but you're still my friend and the only one I have that's left that's known me as long as you have. I'd be honored to have my son named by a griffin as wonderful as you, Aura. Aura looked at the chick. His feathers were a dark blue, almost like Stardust's mane. His eyes were a pale green that matched his fur, and he had black talons like his mother with an orange beak. Finally, Aura put one talon on his head. You remind me of my grandfather. I believe that you may be him reborn. So I name you Alistar. May your life be forever joyous, and you grow up to be strong. Natalia put her talons on Aura's, saying, You honor me, honor me, friend. Thank you. When we left, I asked Aura, What happened to her life partner? She sighed. He was the griffin who was shot by Gina outside Stable 28. One of Eris's wing. 
Oh, I had no idea. She smiled. It's not your fault, Shadow. He died doing his job. He wouldn't have wanted it any other way. He might not be here to see his new son born, but he still left his mark on the world. We spent more time meeting with griffins and having more fun with our friends. Windthrasher and Wingnut found us later. Both looked a lot better than they did in the morning. I couldn't help but chuckle a little as Wingnut told me about a strange dream he had where he could have sworn he was hugging Bite. Finally, as darkness fell across the canyon, Tonto made his way onto stage with a young, much younger griffin that stood behind him. Who's the kid? I asked Aura as the griffins around us started to go quiet. That's Toby. He's Tonto's assistant. He's learning Tonto's role in the Red Talon so that one day he can take over for the older griffin when he passes. She replied. He's so young, though. I said. He is, but he's been working with Tonto for ten years. The keeper of history, like Tonto, is always started out very young, and learned from the older griffins so they can take over one day. Now shush. I want to hear this. Tonto's stories are always fun. She said. I shrugged and sat down next to her with Windthrasher and Stardust on one side of me. Wingnut, Bite, and Vervain on the other side of Aura. Tonto waited till everyone was quiet before saying, Thank you, one and all, for joining me tonight, so close to the first day of the rebirth celebration. Like every year, tonight I will tell a story of our past. Not because no griffin doesn't know the story, but because sometimes one needs to be reminded. History can teach us a lot, like how we can avoid making the same mistakes as our ancestors. He paused looking over at the hundreds of griffins and some ponies, then continuing. Today, I want to talk about something I recently learned about what our founder, Greta, had been led to start the Red Talons. For many years, we thought it was always because the pony she called friend for most of her life destroyed Griffinstone. His name is Taboo in the Red Talons, but you all know who he is. He is the pony who helped build the Enclave. He is the pony who took away the sun and the moon by blanketing the skies with clouds. We do not speak his name here, but he is well known. This pony betrayed his best friend, or so we thought. The crowd was utterly quiet as Tonto talked. During Tonto's next pause, I nudged Aura, asking, How many stories does he tell? Just one, normally. Now shush, I can't hear him. She answered, her eyes glued on Tonto. Then she looked back at me. Where are you going? Whispering so I wouldn't interrupt Tonto as he continued. I just watched the memory orb he's telling you about. How did you hear the story, too? I'm going to say hi to Fletch. She's on guard duty tonight. Ah, fine. I figured you'd like to at least spend some time with me. She huffed. I do. But you're too into this. I'll be back soon, I said. I kissed her cheek, ignoring the looks I got from two younger griffins from other Nalar Talon group, and walked past the rest of the griffins and headed up the small walkway that led to the top of the cliff face. I was only about halfway up when I found the walkway didn't go up any higher. I guess that makes sense. The place was made for griffins. They can fly. Why build a walkway to the top of the cliffs and make it easier for enemies to get to you? For a moment, I thought about going back to Aura, seeing if she'd be willing to fly me to the top. Then I thought better about it. She was too interested in Tonto's story. Then I remembered that I'd seen the top of the cliffs before in Greta's memories. If I could hit myself in the stupid, I would. I could just teleport up there. Summoning my magic, I teleported up on the top of the cliffs. Once I was up there, I took a long moment to look down at the Crimson Canyon. It was amazing how beautiful it was from all the way up here. Tonto was still on stage, telling his story about the night Greta left the Enclave. I can just make out his words even up here. He was telling the ponies around about how this betrayal Greta left felt to find more of her own kind. Some of the griffins down there won't like the truth Tonto was to give, but they'd get over it. One day. Turning away from the side I was on, I started to head towards the east entrance where Fletch said she'd be. I hadn't got more than a few feet when I heard 
something lying next to me. I stopped, but didn't turn to see who was there. Instead, I ready Dreamwalker. Whatever just landed a few feet away was heavy. I could tell from how he or she landed. Then a chill went down my spine as I heard a deep metallic voice say, Greeting, Shadow Star. Slowly, I turned my head to find a griffin dressed in power armor, like I had never seen before on a griffin. His entire body was covered in black. His wings were the only thing exposed. I couldn't tell what his colors were because he used the darkness around him to hide himself as best as he could. On his helmet, I saw glowing red coming from the visor. On his chest, painted in white, was the symbol of the unchanged talons. I drew Dreamwalker and pointed it right at him. Get the fuck away from me! He cocked his head to one side as he spoke again in the creepiest, uh, altered voice. Gina said you'd be difficult, but I didn't think you'd point a gun at me so quickly. Shut up and tell me who you are and what you want. He chuckled to himself, then bowed low to me. I am the leader of the Unchained Talons. I'm known to you griffins as Archer. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Courier. Or would you prefer to have me call you Shadow? Archer, huh? Yeah, I heard that name from one of the Red Talons already. Why are you here? I thought a griffin like you would stay as far away from Crimson Canyon as possible. I said. Archer started to chuckle again. And what makes you think that? You know nothing about me, Shadow. You know nothing about what I want or where I come from. Your lackeys have been trying to kill my friends and I. Plus your griffins have been working with Elder Wolfsbane. I said, pulling back on the hammer. Ah, yes. Our contract with Elder Wolfsbane and his steel rangers from Los Alicorn. The whole debacle was quite the disaster. He said, slowly walking around me as he spoke. The disaster? I yelled, feeling a burning rage building up inside of me. He destroyed an entire town, killed some pony I cared about, all with the help of Gina and your damn talon company. Yes, I was quite angry with Gina for letting that happen. I told her three things when she took the job to help Wolfsbane. First, that the town's ponies weren't to be hurt. Second, to keep you and your friends alive. Third, to make sure that Wolfsbane got you back to Las Alicorn. She failed all three. I would have punished her for it, but Aura made me sure that I didn't have to. I kept my eyes on him as he slowly walked around me. I don't get it. Why did you tell her to do that? Why do you care about Cartwheel or me? Also, why do you want me to enlace Alicorn? He chuckled again. Do you know why we're called the Unchained Talons? That caught me off guard. I'm guessing how it has something to do with how the Red Talons are run. They have their ten rules and laws. Your group consistently, mostly banished Red Talons. Don't have any laws. Very good. But you're still wrong. It is true that a lot of my griffins are former Red Talons. But we still have rules. They're just different from the Red Talons. The Ten Laws of the Red Talons were created two centuries ago by a sad, lonely griffin who had a burning hatred inside. She used those laws to chain the griffins she led to her. She made the griffins that joined her think they had to do things the way she said. Made them think that if they didn't stay and work with her to make her talon group a reality, they'd be failing all of griffin kind. It worked. And because of that, the Red Talons became one of the most respected and feared Talon groups in all of the Wasteland. The Unchained Talons refused to be held down by stupid laws like that. The only laws we follow are that of the Contract, and to follow the Griffin who is stronger. He said, finally stopping to look down at Crimson Canyon. It sounds the same to me. They're just using different words for the same goal. You want them to follow you and do as they're told. You also didn't answer any of my questions. Oh. But they're very different, Shadow. First of all, my griffins can take on any contract they want. Be it with the Enclave, the Steel Rangers, or just some random pony in the Waste. Hell, even the Romans. 
Also, we don't kick griffins out because their sexuality or who they like are with when the Red Talons do. If one of my griffins gets into a fight with another and they fight to the death, then that's their problem. The only time we have to do what they are told is when we have a big contract, like the one with those steel rangers. Even then, I choose who will participate in the bigger contracts, he said, chuckling more. Stop talking in circles. As you wish, he said, finally turning back to look at me. The reason I wanted you and your friends kept safe is because of my own contract that I have made with a very important mare. She also wants you brought to Las Alicorn. Let me guess, my mother, Grim, you might know her as Cloak? No, the mare that I am talking about is the Director, the mare who runs the Ministry. She contacted me, personally, a little over a month ago, when she realized that she couldn't rely on her own agents to fetch you. He pointed at my pip-buck. That mark, too, you have there belongs to her, you see, and she wants it back. Your mother was supposed to bring it to her eight years ago when she left Stable 28. Instead, she left it in the stable, and now you have it. Why am I not surprised? Every pony wants my damn pip-buck. Well, if that's true, then why has Gina been trying to kill me? It only seems like she's trying to kill you, so she can keep up the disguise that she hates you. In truth, she has done everything she can to make sure you'll live. Bullshit, I said as I pointed Dreamwalker at him. Why are you here, then? You're trying to take me back to Los Alicorn? Not at all. Mostly, I just wanted to meet you. I've heard so much from others, and I wanted to see if what they heard is true. So far, I'm not that impressed. But I do see promise in you, he said. Why shouldn't I kill you here and now and take care of the problem for the Red Talons while I'm at it? He started to laugh. Child, that gun isn't powerful enough to make it through my armor. I grinned as I pulled out a different mag and swapped it. One that Stardust said should always have on me just in case I run into armored ponies. Wanna bet your life on that? You shouldn't make threats you can't deliver on, he said with another chuckle. Unlike others I've you've run into in the past, I'm not scared of you. If you say so. I pulled the trigger. Archer jumped to one side, but his power armor slowed him down. Instead of the bullet ripping through his head like I intended, the armor piercing round I loaded in a dreamwalker blew through his left shoulder. Blood sprayed out of the hole, followed by a yelp of pain from Archer as he slammed to the ground. I then fired again, but this time he was ready for it. He threw a flash bomb before I could get my shot off. I closed my eyes just as it went off, but it was still enough to distract me for him to fly away. When I opened my eyes, he was high above me, holding onto his left shoulder. You're full of surprises, I'll admit that. I didn't think you'd have AP rounds for that weapon. Why don't you come down here and face me? Or are you gonna run away, just like Gina? Like I said before, I only came to meet you, Shadow. Don't worry, we'll meet again very soon, and then I won't be caught off guard. Until then, he said. Then, with the flap of his wings, he was gone. Motherfucker. I said, holstering Dreamwalker. What was that all about? A moment later, Fletch landed next to me, looking around with her spear at the ready. I heard a gunshot. What happened? I just had the unfortunate pleasure of meeting Archer, the leader of the Unchained Talons. You just missed him. Fletch looked down at me, shocked. What the hell did he want? How did he even get over here? We have patrols over the canyon. I have no idea. It's possible that he came in with some of the other griffins in the celebration. He was in a full set of griffin power armor. He hid everything about what he looked like. Fuck. We have to go tell Mom about this. Come on. Hop on my back. Fletch shed. Sighing, I hopped aboard the Griffin Express, holding on tight as Fletch took the air and flew back towards the den. I started to think about what Archer said and who contacted him. What would the Ministry want with me or the Mark II? Do they want it for the same reason as Mom, or does this pit buck that's stuck to my foreleg 
have more information on it than even Mom knows about. Either way, the more I learn about it, the more I'm certain that I'll have to head to Lost Alicorn. I couldn't put it off much longer. I have to deal with Mom, get my uncle back, deal with Wolfsbane, and find out what this director wants of a Mark II. A moment later, I was lost in my thoughts, and we were already outside the den, with Gigi standing at her usual spot, overlooking some paperwork. It took a little over an hour for me to explain what happened with Archer and to answer Gigi's question. And the whole time I was in the den with her, Tonto and Apollo never joined us. Tonto I could understand. He was still finishing up his part of the rebirth celebration for one day. But Apollo was another matter. From what I heard, he drank too much earlier and wasn't feeling well. Something was going on and I didn't like it. First, I found Apollo talking to another griffin outside the canyon. A griffin that left a feather behind that reminded me a lot of Gina. On top of that, he lied to me about what he was up to. I just know it. Then, my meeting with Archer. Now Apollo's sick. Something deep inside of me told that Apollo had something to do with the Unchained Talons. Commander Redwood told me that Apollo had been acting strangely as of late, and he hasn't been giving his report on the Romans like they contracted him for. Then griffins from a Talon group Redwood didn't know about were leaving messages for Apollo. The only thing I could think of was that Apollo was using his vast resources to spy on the Unchained Talons. There's no way he'd work with them. There are monsters that don't follow the same kind of code that he does. Also, he'd never work with Gina, the griffin that killed the griffin he loved. I want to tell Gigi what I'm thinking, but I can't. Not without proof, and a single feather from her sister wouldn't prove anything. I'll have to talk to Tonto again when I can. Maybe once the celebration's over. Once I finished with Gigi, I, she put more guards around Crimson Canyon. I set out a small team to see if they could find Archer, even though we both knew they wouldn't find him. I met up with my friends, and we all headed to bed. Tomorrow was the second day of the celebration, and no matter what happened with Archer or Gina or even Apollo, I'm not going to let that stop me from having fun with my friends. The next day came quickly, at least for me. For the first time in a while, I felt like I got a full night of sleep. That could have been from cuddling up next to Aura. After a quick breakfast with the others, we all headed towards the arena to watch the fights. So, are these fights going to be like the ones with Fletch and you? When Thrasher asked as we sat on one of the overlooks to view the arena. Aura shrugged. It depends upon how good the fighters are. Not many griffins outside the Red Talons are as good fighters of myself or my family. Also, the first fights will mostly be younger griffins. I watched as two griffins in their late teens entered the arena. One was wearing a leg band with a red talon emblem on it. The other had none. They both chose their weapons, one picking a scimitar and the other a lance. As they both started to fight, I looked back at Aura and asked, Are the rules the same as they were with your fight? No. It would take too long to do a fight that goes to ten points. With these fights, the winner is the first to land a killing blow. Just watch. I'm sure the kid with no talent company will win this one. She said. Why do you think that? Wingnut asked. The Red Talon Griffin's bigger. Stardust answered for Aura. Bigger doesn't always mean he'll win. The other Griffin has the advantage of being smaller. He's also using a lighter weapon that's easier to wield. The Red Talon Griffin is using a lance which has more reach, but it's harder to change its direction because of its weight. The unassociated Talon Griffin has more riding on this fight than the Red Talon Griffin does. If he loses, he'll still be without a talent company. Hora added. Sure enough, the smaller griffin ducked behind the blunted blade of the lance, twisted around and the bigger griffin and jabbed his scimitar into the other griffin's leg. The bigger griffin yelped and dropped his lance. The smaller griffin kicked him in the side, then flew into the air, twisted around and brought the scimitar down on the bigger griffin's neck. Vervanda, who was medi mediating the fight, lifted her talons, saying loudly, Gavan is the winner, and with this win, his request to become part of the Red Talons as a new recruit of our training program is approved. Gavan, the smaller griffin, helped the bigger Red Talon up and said, Thank you for putting up a good fight. The Red Talon griffin chuckled. You're quick and skilled. I look forward to training with you, Gavin. Welcome to the Red Talons. 
Damn, that was fast, Bites said, her eyes glued on the two griffins as they walked out of the arena. They were a mismatched pair. Gavin had the upper talent on the other kid. Normally, a griffin who wants to join is paired off with a griffin that's close to their size, Mora said. Fletch, who was sitting on their side, Avora, along with Sin, said, Gavin's been friends with him for years. He's from the Lunar Talons down south. Wasn't that Talon group destroyed a couple years back? Aura asked. Yeah, Gavin and two others were the only ones who survived. They've been freelancing ever since. Gavin made friends with some of the younger Griffins over the past couple years and finally was old enough to try and join us. He requested to fight his friend, and Gigi agreed, so here we are, Fletch said. I'm surprised they'd let him fight his own friend. What if he tried to cheat? Windthrasher asked. Fletch shrugged. We've seen it. V knows most of the younger Griffins fight, so she would have seen it if he tried to let his friend win. Either way, I think Gavan will be a great addition to the Red Talons. We sat back and watched as two more fights went on. One of them lasted a good half hour. Both griffins were evenly matched. In the end, the Red Talon griffin was able to win against her foe. The griffin who lost stumped away after throwing his spear to the ground. As she walked away, I yawned, then asked Aura, Why don't I go wander around for a little bit? She shrugged, looking back at me. What else is there to do? Most of the griffins are here, and there isn't anything else going on tonight. I really want to look at one of my memory orbs and see how Vervain is doing. She shrugged. Okay, I'll come check up on you in a couple hours when we take a break. Sounds good. I said, getting up and walking away. I only got a few feet away from the platform when Wingnut came running up to me. Hey, Shadow, can I come with you? I looked back at him. Sure, but I thought you wanted to watch the fights. I did, but... I'd rather go with you. Why? I asked as we pushed our way past the few griffins who were heading towards the arena. You said you wanted to go into a memory orb, and I figured I'd keep an eye on you while you did, he said. That sounds like a good idea, honestly. Even here, you never know what could happen. Though I was planning on visiting Vervain first. She should be in Sandstone right now. No, she's visiting Tonto. I saw her before the first fight started. Damn. Well, I guess I'll check out the memory orb first, then. Though I have no clue how long it's going to last. You might be bored. I said as I turned to head back towards the cave. I'll find something to do. He said as he trot next to me. As we walked back to the cave, something came to me. You know what? I think I have something you might like to see. I've been meaning to show it to you for a little while, but I keep on forgetting. I walked back into my room and started digging through my saddlebags as Wingnut spoke nonchalantly. Shadow, you shouldn't have. You're taken. What would Aura think? I rounded on him in a well-deserved brain duster. Are you kidding me, Wingnut? Gee, Shadow, can't you take a joke? He said as he rubbed his head. Impossible colt. I sighed and laughed a little as I dug into my saddlebags, pulling out the blueprints I found for the lucky horseshoe. I found these while I was with the stranger while we were at Spitfire's Flight Academy, I said. He took them and started to look them over, his eyes going wide. Are these the blueprints for the Lucky Horseshoe? I think so, but the thing I found strange about them was this, I said, pointing down at the basement level and the antenna that seemed to go from the basement all the way to the roof. It looks to me like there's more to that old casino that meets the eye. But I don't know anything about blueprints. He took a moment to look them over. Yeah, I've learned a lot about blueprints over some of the books I've read, so this shouldn't be any problem for you to figure out. But I find strange that this isn't an antenna. It's a sub-basement below it. Also, there seems to be another chamber that connects to it. My casino wouldn't need any of this. I'll have to look through the installation plans to see what they did, or what they tried to hide inside. It's a good thing you found the contractor's blueprints and not the submitted ones. I cocked an eye to one side. What do you mean? He rolled his eyes. 
A lot of big buildings like this have two sets of blueprints. One is the set that goes to the contractor that builds the structure. The other is the set that's set to the ministries for approval. Normally, when a business wants to add things to the structure, but doesn't want the government to know, the blueprints they submit won't have everything on them than what they're doing. You found the ones that have everything on them, which is good for us. Oh, I see, I said. So do you think you can find out what the Children of the Night were doing with them? I'm not sure, but I can at the very least find out what they tried to put in the building that wasn't part of the submitted plans. This might take me a while, so I'll go over them while you're in the orb, he said, moving over to a small desk. There's my smart little colt. Let me know if you find anything, I said, pulling out the memory orb I took from the lucky horseshoe. I moved to lay down on the bed while Wingnut started going over the blueprints. I touched the memory orb to my horn and concentrated my magic on it. Like before, the voice of Nightstalker echoed inside my head. What is my name? Taking in a deep breath, I replied, Absent Moon. This time, instead of a spark of power throwing me away from the orb, I felt a connection. Feeling more relieved that I got the name right, the world melted away. The memory started unlike none other I have experienced before. Night Stalker was flying through a nasty thunderstorm in his power armor. Rain was coming down in sheets, lightning flashing in the distance, and the wind slamming into him. If it wasn't for the tech in Night Stalker's armor, he wouldn't have been able to see a thing through the storm. Luckily, his helmet had night vision that was able to see through the murky darkness. From what I could see, he was over a city that sat next to an ocean. At the moment, he was flying around the tallest building in the city, a huge skyscraper that towered over the rest of the sky carriage, landing platform on the top. Right now, the landing platform was empty, apart from a single earth pony standing in the rain, as if he was looking for something. As Night Stalker flew around, looking down at the pony, Greta's voice echoed from his calm. Boss, do you read me? I do. What's the word? Night Stalker asked. The target's two minutes out, coming from the east like you thought. But he has three Pegasus escorts. Greta replied. Are they military? No, private contractors. They look like former Shadow Bolts. I know at least one of them is. Greta replied. Lightning Dust's voice echoed in Night Stalker's comms next. They all are. Two of them are part of the squad that was discharged after the Battle of Hoofington. Their leader is in the Shadow Bolts. He's a sergeant with the 6th Battalion. His records say he's supposed to be stationed in the front lines near the Badlands. Great. I'll... looks like things. I'll have to redo a plan a little bit. I want both of you to keep an eye on the skies around the bank building. If he has three Pegasi guarding his sky carriage, he's bound to have more. Night Stalker said as he flew higher, watching the sky carriage to arrive. I don't think that's a good idea, boss, Lightning Dust said. I'll be fine. I have some pony inside. Well, some zebra. Are you sure we can trust Nuair on this mission? Greta asked. I can hear you, you know, Greta. Please do have a little more faith in me. The voice of Nuer said to his calm. He proved himself when he helped us take down his brother during the Battle of Lost Pegasus. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have survived. Now, do as you're told, Night Stalker said. They both responded, yes, sir. Night Stalker watched the skies to the east as the carriage showed up in the dark skies. One Pegasus pulled the carriage, three others in combat armor flying around it. The way they flew made it look like the storm was making it hard for them. Night Stalker seemed to be doing fine, though. Something about the armor must be helping. Neither that, or he was used to flying in weather like this. The sky carriage landed, and the pony who had been waiting on the roof ran over to them as the door opened for whoever was inside. Night Stalker tapped the gem up near his ears to his helmet. As soon as he did, the sound of the storm around him seemed to fade, and the pony who opened the door's voice was easier to hear. Welcome to the Equestrian Bank, sir. We've been expecting you. The voice of a zebra came out of the door to the sky carriage. I have taken a great risk coming all the way here, Mr. Cole. 
I hope that your boss is not lying when he told me he had information that would help win my war. If so, we will make an example of what happens when you cross a prince of the zebra tribes. The pony called Mr. Cole bowed a little, saying, I assure you that my boss has what you want. If you'd just follow me inside? Night Stalker watched as a huge zebra got out of the sky carriage and followed the pony through the downpour into the building. When they were gone, Night Stalker tapped the gem on his ear again and said into his calm, I'm going in. Lightning Dust and Greta, you keep an eye on those three and watch for my ponies in the sky. Boss, are you sure it's wise to go in there alone? You don't know who else is helping that zebra, Greta said. Maybe not, but we can't risk them getting their hooves on whatever was stolen. If the Caesar sees this intel, falling shadows will be exposed, and we can't risk that information getting out. The same goes for Project Solar Flare. We don't have time to wait. Night Stalker said before activating the gem in his chest. Just like the stranger used the one on his trench coat, time seemed to slow down. Night Stalker dove for the rooftop. He landed hard in a spray of water that seemed to hover in the air. He moved over to the door. There was a number pad on it, and he quickly entered six numbers. The light turned green right as the spell that slowed time finished. The door clicked, and he pushed the door open for the pegasi around him could see. The Night Stalker closed the door behind himself, then locked it. He took a moment to take in his surroundings, then said into his calm, I'm in. Noir, do you have eyes on our target, and is the zebra we thought it is? Or just a stand-in? I do. And they are on their way to the main office, on the top floor, and as far as I can tell, it is him. Do you want me to take him out, sir? No. We need to know if this other pony has what we came for. Once we know that, we'll take him out, Night Stalker said. He tapped another gem on his armor. A moment later, his body vanished as if he turned on a stealth buck. Once he did, he started to move down the hall. He passed by a few security guards and two mares who were talking near an elevator, before making his way towards two double doors. They were just standing, shutting as the zebra and earth pony walked in. Night Stalker flapped his wings and flew into the room silently right before the doors closed. As soon as he did, he flew over to a dark corner of the room and watched as the zebra walked over to the large desk where the fat pony was sitting. His chair turned towards the floor-to-ceiling windows, watching the storm outside. When the zebra made his way to the desk, the fat pony said, I see you finally arrived, Zatan. I hope your journey here wasn't too unpleasant. The zebra rolled his arms. I was not expecting such a bad storm today. I was lucky the Pegasi who flew me here made it through without us crashing. Ha <laughs> ha Yes, my apologies. I bribed the weather patrol to help mask your sky carriage. I told them I wanted a nice rainfall for the day. From the looks of it, they went a little overboard. The fat pony chuckled to himself. Zoltan rolled his eyes again, unamused. Be that as it may, I did not come here to talk to you about the bad weather, Mr. Banks. I came here because you said that you have information that I would find interesting. I do not like wasting time with scumbag ponies such as yourself unless I have to. Now, do you have the information or not? The fat pony grinned wider. Straight to business, I see. I'll never understand why you stripes are so edgy all the time. In a flash, Zoltan reached across the desk, took Mr. Banks by the scruff of his suit, and slammed his face down. In a calm tone, he said, I do not want to hear that word escape your lips again, Mr. Banks. I am a zebra and the oldest son of the Caesar. You will call me by my name or by my title. If you are talking about my race, you will use the correct word for them. Do I make myself clear? Mr. Banks was shaking, his eyes wide as he said quietly, Yes, sir. Zoltan let him go. There is a good buck. Now tell me what you have before I decide to throw you off the roof of this skyscraper. Mr. Banks looked over at the other pony in the room. Mr. Cole, bring me the item in question. Right away, sir. Mr. Cole said, trotting over to a large painting of the fat pony, 
and pushing it aside to reveal a large safe set in the wall. He opened it quickly, then took out a box. After closing the safe, he brought it to Mr. Banks. Here you are, sir. Thank you, Mr. Banks said, taking the box and opening it. It's all here. Memory orbs from the group of the ponies that call themselves the Children of the Night. According to all records, they don't even exist. Which brings me to believe that there's some kind of black ops team that works with one of the ministries. There's also documents about a couple of projects they're working on, as well as intel on your movements near Las Pegasus. They're led by a stallion that goes by the name of Night Stalker. Zoltan reached into the box and pulled out a memory orb. Then, after setting on the desk, he pulled out a few sheets of paper. He took a moment to look them over, his eyes getting wider as he read. This intel cannot be correct. This stargazer project should not be possible for a pony. Even if it was, the creature that they would have pulled down would kill them if they saw it. I assure you it is real. My contact said that everything he was able to gather is real. If you think that Stargazer Project is bad, look at the other one, that they call Solar Flare. It's a project that they just finished. And if what I read is true, they could take out an entire platoon of your zebras in a single shot, Mr. Banks said. Zoltan picked up the memory orb again and asked, I am guessing that the memory orbs will prove what you say is correct. As far as I know, yes. I wasn't able to watch any of them. Couldn't get my hooves on a recollector. The ministries are making it almost impossible for normal citizens to get them anymore, Mr. Banks said. Looking up, Zoltan asked, How did you get your hooves on this intel? I'm sure you have your ways to find things out. But if this team really is Black Ops, there is no way a pony like you would have gotten this so easily. Mr. Banks smiled again. Let's just say I have my own ponies on the inside. One of them works at the casino that they use as a base of operations. Have you shown this intel to anyone else? Zoltan asked. No, only Mr. Cole and myself know about it. Then why give it to me? We are enemies, Zoltan said. Mr. Banks wasn't smiling anymore. He looked down at his desk. I am not like the other ponies, Zoltan. Personally, I think this war is pointless and bad for business. The sooner it is over, the better. Night Stalker whispered as quietly as he could into his calm. Intel Seer, Noir, move in. Be there in two minutes, boss, Noir replied. Zoltan was looking around the office. His eyes fell on a picture just behind the fat pony. I see. This is more personal for you, isn't it? Mr. Banks went pale for a moment. Yes, it is. So do you want with the intel? Is or all I care about is that you pay me the price we agreed upon. It is always about the bits, is it not? No, oh, well... Yes, the price we agreed upon will be wired to you once we get back to my father, Zoltan said, putting the papers and memory orb back into the box. How do I know I can trust you? Mr. Banks asked. Zoltan smiled. I have not killed you, have I? That should be reason enough for you to trust me. I, I guess you're right. Mr. Banks said, sitting back in his chair, then wiping the small bit of blood that leaked from his nose when Zoltan slammed his head on the table. You did the right thing by giving this to us, Zoltan said then, stopping to look back at the box. You said the pony who leads these children of the night is called Night Stalker. Yes, he's said to be one of Princess Luna's personal guards, though he's never in Cantalot with her. Not much of a god, if you ask me. Sullivan's face went dark as he said, He is the pony who killed my brother in Los Pegasus. Him and a zebra who should have been killed. I think I read something like that in the papers, Mr. Cole said. I don't know that zebra who was leading the attack was your younger brother, Zoltan. Neither did my boss. Zoltan ignored the other pony and started to look around the office again. Only this time he looked angry. Are you sure that no pony knew that you had this intel? 
Of course not, Mr. Banks said. I was careful when I took it from my contact. Zoltan looked a little. Careful? Night Stalker is not a pony you can just be careful with, Mr. Banks. He is working with my brother, a zebra who is great at fighting and figuring out the plans of others. Together, they are a force to be reckoned with, and for all I know, they know I am here. You should have told me who this intel came from before I came. Night Stalker watched as the zebra took the box and started to pack back away from the desk. He smiled and lowered the stealth from his armor, saying, You're right, Prince Zoltan. He was a fool to think he could get away with this. The zebra jumped and looked at my host with fear in his eyes. I should have known this was a trap. Let me guess, Night Stalker. You have half the shadow bolts just waiting for me outside the tower. Mr. Banks, on the other hoof, fell out of his chair when Night Stalker appeared. How the fuck did you get into my office? From the reports I got, you're still in Las Pegasus. How did you get to Las Alicorn so fast? Night Stalker looked over at Mr. Banks and Mr. Cole and smiled. According to spies you have in my tower, I'm sure they do think I'm still there. Nice trick, one of the unicorns. Now, shut your yap. I'll get to you two in a moment. Right then, the door to the office slammed open, and a pony was standing there in a body tight black suit that covered his entire body, with orange goggles over his eyes. When he spoke, I realized it wasn't a pony. It was nowhere. Hello, brother. Long time no see. Zoltan looked back at the other zebra and frowned. So, you are still alive, Zappen. Father said you betrayed us. But I still cannot believe it. What does this Pegasus have on you that makes you work for him? He saved my life, Zoltan. He showed me kindness even when I was his prisoner, and he showed me the truth about this war. I'm working for him because he is on the right side of the war, unlike Father. Also, Father stripped me of my name. I am reborn now, brother, as Noer. Noer said. That's right, Zoltan. Now how about you come with us peacefully? It'd be a shame for the great Caesar to lose his last son to some stallion who took his other two. Night Stalker said. Zoltan grinned. I do not think so, Night Stalker. You may have killed Zak Kajin, but he was more brawn than brains. I will not let you use your tricks on me. In a flash, Zoltan put his zebra stealth cloak out of his saddlebags and put it on himself. It was the same time throwing a small ball on the ground. Smoke filled the room as soon as the ball hit the ground. Night Stalker and Noir both backed away from the smoke. Zoltan used the distraction to throw on his cloak and vanish before they could do anything. Night Stalker growled and yelled at Noir, Go after him. I'll catch up. Then he said into his comms, Lightning Dust, Greta, Zoltan escaped the intel. Take out the Pegasi and make sure he doesn't get away. As Noir ran away, his brother and Night Stalker's team replied to his orders. He turned back towards the other two ponies. Mr. Cole pulled out a pistol from his jacket and fired. I won't let you hurt Mr. Banks! The bullet just bounced off his armor. A gem embedded into it, glowing a little as it did. My stalker jumped forward and spun. His left wing shot out and the sword under the blade sliced cleanly through Mr. Cole's neck. His head went flying only to land right on Mr. Banks' desk. Blood leaking out onto the papers. The eyes wide as they looked up at Mr. Banks. Its jaw opened in surprise. You really should hire better help when dealing in black market trade, Mr. Banks. Tell me, who gave you all of that information? Night Stalker slid slowly, walking towards the fat pony who was looking at my host like he was a demon from hell. You just killed an equestrian citizen. You'll be executed for that. Night Stalker laughed. I sure did. But I don't think I'll get in trouble for killing him. Or you. Treason is a serious crime, and he was a traitor to the crown. Both of you are. I don't see anything wrong with killing ponies like you. Now tell me. Who gave you the information? The memory orbs. All of it. He started to shake. 
I don't know his name. He never showed me his face, just gave he gave me his name. He just said the intel would be helpful to the zebras and that I could make some bits off of it. Night Stalker brought his wing up and let the sharp edge of one of the blades come within an inch of Mr. Banks' neck. Do you expect me to buy that? Why would any pony want to help the zebras? I have my reasons. This war has gone on too long, and with what you've got planned, it'll only get worse. Mr. Banks said. As he spoke, Night Stalker looked at the same picture as Zoltan had. It was a picture of Mr. Banks. A younger-looking zebra, who was mildly attractive, and a filly, who looked to be around eight. The filly had a few stripes on her, and her eyes looked more like a zebra's than a pony's. I think I understand now. You want this war over because of her. Right. Mr. Banks looked over at the picture as well. A few tears fell from his eyes. My wife, Kafra, and our daughter, Golden Sky. I did it for them. Night Stalker lowered his wings. From the records I've looked at about you, you say they aren't married. Not legally. I met her a few years ago. She was one of the first refugees that came to Los Alicorn when the war started to get worse back east. I fell in love and we had a daughter. Because of this blasted war, I've had to keep them hidden so they'll be safe from ponies like you, he said. And you thought that helping a zebra would make this world better. Night Stalker said in a mocking tone. At least they would accept my wife and my daughter. Better than equestrians would. You're wrong there, Mr. Banks. Do you know what the Caesar does to zebras who have children with ponies? He has all zonies killed. And the same with the zebra who had them. Luna doesn't care who some ponies with as long as they aren't helping the enemy. I didn't know. I just wanted a better world for my family. Night Stalker sighed. I know the feeling, Mr. Banks. If you tell me everything you know of the pony who gave you this information, I'll let you go. His eyes went wide. Really? You have my word as Night Stalker, the leader of the Children of the Night. Night Stalker swore. Then, the pony who gave me the intel works in your tower. He's a pegasus that has access to every part of your base. He works with the Ministry of Awesome. That's all I know. I don't believe you. No pony could have gotten the information unless they were a member of the Children of Night. And I know none of my team would betray me like that. Mr. Banks put his hooves up. I'm telling the truth. The only thing he said was, when I asked him how he knew all this was true, is he said that he was there when your team was working on some power system near the bases. That's all. Night Stalker took a moment to think. Maybe one of the workers was able to get information from there. Most of what I saw was stored there, I guess, so it's possible. I'll have to ask Minette if anybody could have gotten past her protections, or if the memory spell she used could have not worked on some pony. It's possible, but I don't know. Now, can you let me go? I told you everything, Mr. Banks said as he shook in his chair. Night Stalker walked past him, then pushed a button next to one of the windows. I am a stallion of my word. I will let you go. Thank you so much, sir. Mr. Banks said, getting to his hooves. Night Stalker moved quickly. He took hold of the fat pony and threw him to the ground next to the open window. Who said I'd let you leave through the halls? Mr. Banks' eyes went wide. You said I can go. How else am I to leave this place? And you can. But you'll go through the window. I can't afford to let you tip any pony off about me being here once you're out of my sight. Mr. Banks looked at the rainy sky and started to shake. I'm an earth pony. I can't just jump out of a window. I know your limitations, dirt pony. Now jump, Night Stalker said. I'll die. You said you'd let me go. You gave me your word, Mr. Banks yelled. I did. And I'm not breaking my word. I said I would let you go. I never said that I'd let you live. You know too much about the children, and sadly for you, I don't have Manette with me to modify your memory. So, this is the only way I can be sure no pony finds out about my team and my plans for the war. Now jump, he said coldly. Fuck you, Night Stalker. I'm not going to kill myself. 
If you really want me dead, then do it yourself. My host smiled wider. And that's not how this is going to go. No pony can know that I was here. Once you jump, I'll be sure that your death of your ponies looks like the work of zebras or zebra sympathizers. Your death will go down as a suicide. I might even make sure that you go down looking like a hero who killed yourself rather than give the zebras what they wanted. No pony's going to believe that. I won't do it! Nightstalker moved his face closer to Mr. Banks. Either you jump, or I'll go find your wife and child and bring them back here. I'll have you tied up and make sure you're watched as I push both of them out this window after telling them it was because you were too proud to die to save their lives. Mr. Banks' face went from angry to horrified in an instant. You wouldn't do that. How could any pony threaten us to kill a child just so we can get his way? I have no idea what you're talking about, Mr. Banks. If your daughter or your wife die, it's because of you, not me. I'll make sure they're both known that before they both go splat. You're a monster. Nightstalker smiled, vanished as he sighed. A monster I might be, but at least I'm not a fucking traitor like you. Now either jump, or let your family jump. Mr. Banks looked back at the open window, fear written on his face. I hope one day that you look back at this moment and hate yourself for what you did. Trust me, I won't. Nightstalker said. Mr. Banks took in a deep breath and said, I love you, Kafra. I hope that you and Golden Sky have a good life someday. Mr. Banks walked out of the window. He fell, and the sound of his scream was masked by the wind and thunder outside. Nightstalker waited a moment, then shut the window. Fool. What did he think was going to happen when he decided to give information to the enemy? He sighed again, then went back on his calm. Status report. Greta answered first. The Pegasi are down. Same for the one that was flying the carriage. We just saw a pony jump out of the window. Looks like he didn't make it. I know. That was Mr. Banks. Guess he decided he couldn't live with himself anymore after what he did. Nightstalker said. Lightning Dust laughed in her calm. That or you pushed him. Either way, it looks like we're almost done here. Noir just captured his brother on the roof, and we'll have the intel. It's all here. I'm on my way up, Nightstalker said. He turned and headed towards the hallway that led back to the landing pad. As he walked, he switched the channels of his comm and said, This is Nightstalker with the Royal Guard. I need a sky patrol to get rid of the storm right away. A mayor's voice echoed out of his comm. Nightstalker, what are you doing all the way out here? No, oh, Rainbow. I didn't know you were in Los Alicorn. Switch to a private channel, Rainbow Dash said. Switching over, Nightstalker spoke. Rainbow, we have the intel back from Mr. Banks. Looks like he killed himself before we could capture him. I'll need a cleanup crew here right away. Rainbow Dash sounded angry as she responded. What did you do, Nightstalker? I did my job. Also, since you're at the Weather Patrol base... You need to know that one of the higher-ups is taking bribes to change the weather for some ponies out here. I already know about that. That's why I'm here. A report went out about the weather not staying on schedule and I was looking into it. Now tell me what's going on. Why is Mr. Banks dead? I'll fill you in when we're face to face, ma'am. Right now, I have to deal with a zebra. Rainbow Dash cursed, then said, Did you capture him alive? If so, we need to take him to M.O.M. Nightstalker just made it to the door of the roof. He opened it to see Noir holding his brother in a headlock. Nightstalker smiled and responded to Rainbow Dash. Sorry, but we couldn't take him alive. Talk to you later, boss. He got the communication before he could say anything else. What do you want me to do with this trash, sir? Noir asked. Let him breathe a little. Nightstalker said, then looked at the other Pegasus Zebra Prince as he asked. Tell me all you know about where your father had zebras in or around Las Pegasus. Zoltan spat at Nightstalker's hooves. 
I won't tell the pony who killed my brother anything. I'd rather deal with your Ministry of Morale. I request to be treated as a prisoner of war. Shame. Well, I guess if you won't talk to me, then you're of no real use. I'll let Noir deal with you. Nice stalker said, turning towards Greta and Lightning Dust, who were standing a few feet away. Did you find any more Pegasus? Before they could answer, Zoltan yelled, You fool! Do you really think my brother would hurt or kill me? He may have betrayed us, but he is still family and my little brother. I know him better than you do. Night Stalker turned back towards Zoltan, then looked up at Noir, who was still in his full-body stealth suit. Noir, is that true? You wouldn't kill this zebra because he claims to be your brother. I thought your old family abandoned you. Noir replied, They did. I have no zebra family anymore. Zoltan looked pissed. His name is Zoltan, not Noir. Then he tried to look up at his brother. Brother, what have they done to your brain? Did they brainwash you? Noir looked down at Zoltan. Zoltan is dead. Didn't you hear when father disowned me? I am Noir now, and all you are is a zebra who is trying to destroy my new home. Night Stalker smiled. And what do we do to those who try to destroy our home, Noir? Kill them, Noir replied. Zoltan started to yell again. You have let the stars corrupt you, Zoltan. You have fallen under the spell of nightmare. Noir tightened his hold on Zoltan and twisted his brother's head in a quick jolt, snapping his neck with a loud crack. Noir then pulled the mask off of his face and spat on the body of his brother. No, brother. You have let the stars take hold of you, just like father. Princess Luna is just a pony who cares about her subjects. Night Stalker walked over to her and patted him on the shoulder. You did well, Noir. Now, let's get out of here before the cleanup crew shows up. He looked back at Greta. You sure we got it all? Greta lifted the box, as Alton had before saying. It's all here, and more, boss. Good. Now, let's move out. Lightning Dust walked over to him and kissed him for a long moment, then said, You better hurry. I want you all rested up for tomorrow. Noir took his eyes off the lifeless body of his brig brother, then said, That is right. Your rehearsal dinner is tomorrow, right? Night Stalker grinned. That's right. And I'm expecting my team to throw me a big bachelor party. Lightning sighed. As long as you all don't get too drunk and there's no dancing mares, then that's fine. They all laughed, except Noir. He tried to look like he was happy, but I could see the sadness in his eyes. He may agree with what his big brother has said, but he wasn't happy about it. And before the memory ended, I saw one tear fall to the ground as he said something in zebra to his brother. I opened my eyes slowly, still taking in the strange memory orb of Night Stalkers. From everything I knew about the Children of the Night, no pony should have access to their floors or the intel in Stargazer. Didn't one of Night Stalker's team betray him? If so, who was it? I wanted to dive back into the orb and see if I missed something when I saw Stardust looking at me from the end of the bed. It's about time you're out of that damned orb! He yelled. I blinked and looked around. The cave was dark and the light outside was starting to fade. How long was I out? And where's Wingnut? Stardust looked panicked like something was bothering him. You've been out for almost a couple hours. Wingnut's with Vervain, and so is Bite. And the younger Griffins? But they've just left through the west entrance of Crimson Canyon. What? Why? I asked, getting off the bed. What's going on? You look like a horde of dragons as I said the door. Shadow, I wish it was dragons. I really do. He said, walking over to pick up my barding and duster. Get dressed. We don't have time. I took my stuff and my magic, asking, What the hell's going on? Stardust looked scared. I've never seen my friends scared, at least not like this. His eyes were wide, his breathing heavy, and his wings were shaking as he said, The Unchained Talons are coming. Over 200 griffins are making their way through the east entrance. What? I said, pulling on my barding as quick as I could, making sure Dreamwalker and my plasma rifle were ready to draw. What the hell are they doing here? 
I have no idea. But Gina's leading them. As far as I know, they haven't shown any signs of attacking. Is Archer with them? I asked as I started to head towards the cave entrance. No idea. No pony knows what he looks like. You're the only one who's met him, and he was in power armor, and keeping himself in the shadows. If he's with them, we have no way of knowing, he said, following me out. Or was waiting for us just outside, watching as Griffin started to come out to the east entrance. Sure enough, Gina was landing, uh, leading them, but she wasn't holding any weapons. Instead, she held up a white flag. Looking over at Aura, I asked, Why is Gigi just letting them walk in? Aura was glaring down at her aunt as she said, Because she came in with the flag of parlay. On any other day of the year, we'd have told them to leave or risk death for coming here. But during the rebirth celebration, she has every right to ask for an entrance. And Gigi let her in? She has no choice. All Gigi needed was one member of the council to accept her parlay. From what I heard, Tonto gave it to her. She said, Fuck. Let's get down there before anything happens, I said. Good idea. Just don't do anything unless they do. And that's my mom's orders, Orta said as we all started to run down the main level. We just got close to where Gi was standing with the rest of Ora's sisters as Gina slowly walked up to all of them. Gina smiled wide and bowed a little to her older sister. Gillian, it's wonderful to see you again, sister. Gigi looked ready to explode as she answered, What the hell are you doing here with this filth? Now, now, sister, is that any way to act when my griffins and I came under the flag of truce? Gina asked, a smile on the red griffin's beak. Fuck your truce. You've been banished from our lands forever. You're lucky I haven't shot you. Gigi said, anger leaking out with every word. Oh, dear sister. Have you forgotten that today is the rebirth celebration? Every banished griffin is welcome back during this time of the year. I just wanted to see my old home. The same goes for the griffins with me. Well, some of them at least. Not all of them are former members of the Red Talons. For most griffins, yes. But you Baruch rule eight, Gina. No matter what, you can't ever come back. Not even during the rebirth celebration. Killing a member of the Red Talons is a crime punishable by death. I showed you mercy for what I you did to Gale. You're lucky to even be alive, Gigi said. Gina laughed. Yes, Gale, the little sister that was so great, so honest, so perfect. Normally I'd agree with you about killing a Red Talon, and how great of a crime it is to our kind. But you seem to have forgotten something, sis. Oh, really? And what was that? Geeky growled. Gina's smile grew wider as she said so that all could hear. I may have been the one who killed Gale, but I did it on your orders. Gale was the one who was trying to overthrow you. I found out about it and went to Tonto. He told me. He spoke to you, and when he came back to me and told me what you wanted me to do. So I went to Gale's cave, confronted her about the coup she was planning, and then I killed her. Gigi looked ready to explode, as the griffins around her started to whisper, I gave no such order! You're trying to turn my own griffins against me! It was Gina's turn to be angry. Liar! You betrayed me, sister! I was who, what you wanted me to do, just like I've always done. And what did I get for my loyalty? You said I was the one who was trying to overthrow you. You banished Gale's so-called conspirators, saying they were mine, and banished me. You betrayed me, sister. I never betrayed you. You can't prove anything, Gina. I know what happened, and I did what I had to as leader of the Red Talons. Gigi yelled. Oh, really? You know what I find it funny? That you go back to that every time you get into a bind. You always say that you had to do it because you're the leader. It's all bullshit. If you really are as good of a leader as you say, then why have you been doing such a poor job as of late? Explain that. You haven't been able to stop the Unchained Talons from getting stronger. You couldn't even protect Cartwheel, a town that's been friends with the Red Talons for almost 40 years. You've been sending griffins off on missions without pay to help the fucking carrier. 
You bent the rules and sent your griffins. Go into a active stable breaking rule nine. Even better is the fact that you knew about your daughter sleeping around with a pony and hid it from the rest of Red Talons until you couldn't anymore. It's funny how I get banished for doing something I was ordered to. But when you can just do whatever you want and get away with it. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong, sister. Gina said, her voice getting louder and louder. Gigi took a step back, looking like Gina had just slapped her. You don't know what you're. Apollo walked up to Gigi and put a talon on her shoulder. Where the hell did he come from? It wasn't there a second ago. Gillian, I just spoke with Tonto. She's telling the truth. Gigi pulled away from him. Apollo, what are you talking about? I never gave the order to kill my sister. He bowed his head a little. I know. Tonto did. He just told me. He didn't want you getting mixed up in it, so he told Gina to do what had to be done, and said it was ordered by you. Gigi looked like her world was falling apart. But why would he do that? I have no idea. I think we should have him come down here and explain himself, Apollo said. A few griffins around them seemed to agree as they all yelled something after Apollo spoke. Gina smiled. I agree. But still, you have a lot to answer for, sister. Even if you didn't order the death of Gale, you still hid things from your griffins. You're an unfit leader. You have been for a long time. Oh, no, Aura said, her eyes going wide. Don't do it, Gina. Do what? I asked, but I got my answer. Gina looked over at Aura and sighed. Sorry, Aura. The justice needs to be served. Then she looked back at Gigi. Gillian Blood Talon, in five hours at midnight, I challenge you to a fight to the death for leadership of the Red Talons. And as Apollo said, I never broke Rule 8, so technically I'm still a member of the Red Talons, and I have the right to take your place. Gigi looked like she got some life back into her. No. You can't refuse a challenge for leadership, Gillian, Gina said. I know that, but I won't believe it's true until I speak with Tonto myself, Gigi said. Then Griffins around her started to yell and scream about justice and the truth. Gina put a talon up and yelled, Enough! I agree with Gillian. I can't clear my name without Tonto's word. A Griffin a few rows back yelled, Yeah! Go get the old griff and make him talk so we can hear the truth. Yugi sighed and looked over at V. Go get Tonto from his cave. I want the truth. Gina spoke up. No. Send another griffin to get him. I can't trust that you won't have one of your children do something to him before he can testify. I'll go. I said. Or I'll put a talon on my shoulder. No, you can't get yourself mixed up in this shadow. I pulled away, saying, I'm the only one who can. I'm a courier for the Equestrian Express. I don't take sides. I'll fetch Tonto and bring him back here so he can tell a side of the story. Gina smiled. I like that plan. I trust the courier to keep her word. Gigi sighed. Fine, but I'm sending Apollo with her. Why me? Apollo asked. Because Tonto trusts you, Apollo. If Shadow can't get him to come here, then you can, Gigi said. And that is, if my dear sister can trust that I wouldn't have my own husband kill an old friend. Gina looked at Apollo for a long moment and shrugged. Fine by me, but my challenge still stands. Sister, will you accept it? Mom, don't, Aura said. You don't have to listen to her. She's got something planned. Or I'll be quiet, Gigi said before looking at Gina. Fine. If the evidence about what happened shows that you weren't responsible for the death of Gale, then I will accept your challenge. Gina's blitz speak into a wide smile as she began to speak. Good. I've been waiting for this day for a long, long time.
Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Unlikely companion. You've had your fair share of enemies in the past, but have either found common ground or discovered some hidden truths between you and them. When fighting alongside an enemy-turned-friend, you gain plus one to all attributes. Warning. This perk does not make it easier to befriend an enemy.